Of all the athletes who have traveled the road to Olympic glory, few can match the appeal of the gymnasts, with their amazing displays of strength, technique, and artistry. The first modern Olympic Games were held in 1896. Inspired by the ideals of the ancient Greeks, their founder, Pierre de Coubertin, called upon the youth of the world to gather in Athens. Gymnastics was included as one of the nine sports on the program. Germany dominated the competition, Hermann Weingartner winning medals on the high bar, the rings and the pomp. There was no all-around competition, the team medals were awarded for the horizontal and parallel bars. Olympic gymnastic events became increasingly haphazard. Team apparatus competitions were held in conjunction with tumbling, club swinging and rope climbing. By the 1912 Games in Stockholm, a more stable program had been established, and athlete participation had risen to 2,500 competitors from 28 nations. Fierce competition arose between the Swedish and German gymnasts. In order to satisfy the varying styles, the program included apparatus-based events and the more artistic free exercises. A number of demonstration events were also staged, including an exhibition by the Scandinavian women. By 1924, in Paris, gymnastics had become an established part of the Games. The Games provided the first great gymnastics hero, Leon Stukel, the Slovenian whose career would span two decades. In Paris, Stukel thought he had little hope of winning a medal. We went to Versailles for lunch and didn't get back to the hotel until four o'clock. A crowd of people were waiting in front of the hotel. They came running up to me, shouting, you've won a gold medal in the multiple event and on the bar. We saw the results in the newspaper. That was quite exciting. In his first Olympic Games, the unknown Slovenian had won two gold medals and come fourth on the rings and vault. Four years later in Amsterdam, the gymnastic competition was extended to women. However, women were only allowed to compete in team events until 1952. For Leon Stukel, the games were also a turning point. Amsterdam, uh, had Amsterdam made a very big impression on me. It was there that I first realized what it really meant to win a gold medal. We would stand and watch the winners on the rostrum with their medals and see the results appear on a big screen and hear the anthems. It really was a wonderful spectacle. Also, das war herrlich zu schauen und herrlich auch zu werden. Stukel won gold in his specialist event, the rings, and an overall bronze medal behind the dominant Swiss gymnasts, Georg Mietz and Hermann Hange. If Amsterdam made an impression on the young Slovenian, the 1936 Berlin Games stunned the whole world as they became a showcase for the Third Reich. der elften Olympiade neuer Zeitrechnung als eröffnet.
a mass display of over 12,000 gymnasts heralded German domination in the gymnastic events. Competing in his third Olympic Games, and at the age of 37, Leon Stuckel won silver on the rings, bringing his medal tally to three golds, a silver and two bronze. At the 1952 Games in Helsinki, the Olympic oath was taken by Finnish gymnast Heike Savolainen. His career, the longest of any gymnast in history, had begun at the 1928 Amsterdam Games. Over the next four Olympic Games, he won a total of nine medals, including team gold in 1948. In Helsinki, at the age of 44, Savolainen ended his incredible Olympic career with team bronze. The Helsinki Games marked a decisive turning point in international sport with the arrival of the Soviet Union into Olympic competition. Sport, and particularly gymnastics, became a showcase for the benefits of socialism. Nowhere were Soviet resources more apparent than in Helsinki's gymnastic arena. The Soviet team took five of the top seven places in the combined exercises. Overall gold went to 31-year-old Viktor Chukari. Having escaped the death penalty in a World War II concentration camp, Chukarin epitomized Soviet determination. To his overall title, he added team gold and two gold and two silver medals at individual apparatus. Four years later, in Melbourne, Chukarin defended his overall title. Despite a hand injury sustained in practice, he kept to his original routines and won the overall gold by five hundredths of a mark over Japan's Takashi Ono. In two Olympic Games, Chukarin had won 11 medals and firmly established the Soviet Union at the forefront of the sport. Throughout the 1950s, the Soviet Union produced a succession of superb gymnasts. Yuri Titov, winner of nine Olympic medals. 1954 world champion Valentin Muratov. And Albert Azarian, the innovative specialist and double gold medalist on the rings. In 1960, amid the beauty and splendor of Rome, the Soviet steamroller was brought to a halt as Japan took team gold. Favorite for the overall title was the great Boris Shakli. Born in Kazakhstan in 1932, he was quickly incorporated into Soviet gymnastics. In Rome, he secured silver medals on the pommel and the vault, and gold on the parallel bars, but it was the battle for the all-around competition which became the highlight of his career. His adversary was Japan's Takashi Ono, overall silver medalist behind Viktor Chukarin four years earlier. In what became an epic conflict, Shaklin held his famous iron nerve to win the overall gold by the smallest of margins. In three Olympic Games, Shaklin had won 13 Olympic medals. If 1952 had provided a landmark in the form of the new Soviet superpower, it was also a turning point for the sport as a whole. For the first time in Olympic history, women competed in individual events. The combined winner was Maria Gorokhovskaya of the Soviet Union. She won a silver medal on every apparatus, a performance which has never been repeated. Within the next two decades, women were to revolutionize gymnastics forever. 